Okay, guys, uh, so hopefully all of you um, have attended my last month class. Any of you are new, new students for today, for Saturday, besides the one that are checking me out, um, or everybody has been in my class already? I was here last month. Okay, so this is your second month? Yes, it is. Perfect. Um, may I ask if you finish your first certificate? You got your first certificate? Yes, I did. Oh, congratulations. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, that's the way to do it, you know. Um, finish the class and the last week that you guys don't, we don't see each other, then uh, you can finish your book, take the test. You have two, two tests that you can uh, take. And I recommend that if you fail the first one, do not take the second one right away. So did you use both of them or um, only the first one? I only used the first one, um, but I do plan on taking the second one just to review and get more knowledge off of it. Good. So this is this is good because that's the way that you can also try. And you got good score? Did you got over 70? I did. Good, 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 good. Um, I have Myra telling me this is my third class. I'm still working on my second certificate. Myra, you know, just whatever you can do to be up to speed, that would be excellent. Um, you know, just keep doing it. Since this is your last month, um, you know, uh, that would be perfect. Um, oh, so you just need to take the final exam. Excellent, no problem. Um, okay, so I'm, uh, like always guys, I need to mute. Uh, you all, and I'm just going to give some few minutes, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about uh, the new students that are coming to check, check us out about the course, and then uh, I'll start the class. Today, we're going to cover five chapters. Um, just a reminder uh, that, um, uh, you know, we split it. Uh, I'll be trying to finish by 12 o'clock, and then uh, at least, you know, we'll break for 20, 25 minutes. And then I'll be back to complete the um, the last session because I need a break myself, you know, otherwise I'm not going to have a voice until the end if I speak for four hours, right? Because you guys got the chance to just turn on the, the Zoom and, uh, you know, go away or listen from other sections of the house and drink and eat and everything. So while well, I have to be in front of the camera for four hours. So that's why I break a little bit and everybody's happy. So um, any questions that you might have, guys, since I'm going to mute you, please, I use a lot of the chat. Just ask the questions on the chat. I'll be glad to answer it. Um, you know, that's the best way for me to be turning my head and reading the questions. And as, as I go along the course, I'll try to um, respond to, to your questions if I know it, right? Uh, but um, thank you for, for coming and investing your time with me, guys. Uh, for you, uh, this is your um, this is your first class, your second class, and your third class, right? So I have a variety of uh, students now. Um, it is uh, we're we're approaching. Uh, you know, we were about to be out, and and I think they gave us until April 15, I believe, or April 20. I don't remember that we were going to be able to go out. Um, you know, and start our daily life little by little. But uh, I guess uh, LA County, or I guess every um, the whole of the state, I believe, they decided to extend the time uh, to May 15. So we got a, a couple of more weeks where you know we need to stay at home um, or take precaution. And even after this is over, um, you know, let's try to follow the guidelines and we're gonna have to do and make some adjustments in our regular lives. Um, I'm sure you have had, uh, you are having a lot of time thinking about new things that you're going to be able to um, be doing. Some of you unfortunately have been laid off or lost your job, um, you know, but um, every, every adversity brings uh, a new opportunity. So hopefully, uh, this is for you a new opportunity if you are trying to finish your real estate career. Um, it's not that complicated. As soon as you finish the, the, um, 
the te the classes, uh, you are able to apply for the state test. And within four to six weeks, you can get a, a test date. Now, because, um, because the DRE have decided to stop the testing uh, during April, I'm sure they're gonna come up in May and let us know when will they be um, starting uh, to take tests. So that I really don't have information about it, but I'm sure they will and they will take precautions even if it's in a, in a huge room and maintaining or keeping the six feet or 10 feet distance when you go and allowing only certain amount of people. I believe that that would be the case, um, you know, unless, because I don't know if it's gonna be possible to do it online. But the important thing here is that you accomplish uh, your, uh, finish your courses in three months, and then within two more months, you get your test date and you pass your test and you get a license. So it is very doable if you follow uh, the steps needed to complete your license in five months, okay? Uh, for some of you that are new, um, you know, today, my name is Victor Hugo Del Carpio. Uh, I'm a broker for 36 years. And, um, you know, I'm currently still selling real estate. Um, I don't call so much myself just because of the title, real estate broker. And uh, I'm the broker of record for two offices in, in uh, one in Alhambra and this one in Chino Hills. And this is for Keller Williams. Uh, I have uh, to supervise almost 500 agents, which I believe uh, uh, at least half of them are kind of active, uh, even though at this time uh, production has been reduced a little bit but I still have an office where they're still bringing the listings, believe it or not. So, but my job is to minimize the risk on the transaction. That's basically my job. And I continuously uh, keep selling and uh, my, I, I take care of my database, you know, my previous clients and also get new ones. Uh, and also I have become uh, an instructor for real estate for the past three years and a half. I have helped many students. Some of them have joined my office, but this course is not for you to join Keller Williams, okay? Um, I just wanna provide you um, the value for, for the money and the time that you invest. And my philosophy is I wanna uh, come from contribution and I always give more of what I'm asked for, okay? Uh, already people that, have been attending my class, they know how I am. Uh, I tell you the things like they are. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm just describing the transaction like it is and things that you're gonna find along the way once you start practicing real estate career. Um, you know, in this business, uh, I hope that one of the reasons that you have uh, decided to try another career is, um, the main one is to be able to help other people to help them achieve the American dream. What is the American dream, according to in the US? Is to own a home, okay? Maybe it's not for you, that's not your, your American dream. Maybe your dream is to own a car, you know, I, I don't know. But the American dream to me has been uh, helping people since I became a realtor. Uh, 36 years ago to try to help people to get them out of the renting and trying to help with the different kind of programs, even using down payment assistance uh, and put them in a house. As you know, sometimes when we start, we cannot get the house that we want. We just get the house that we need, right? Um, but um, you have to start somewhere. Sometimes that's your first step. Um, when you become a first time buyer, you're not gonna find your last home. So sometimes we as a realtors have to learn 
how to make uh, the future buyers understand that even though you want certain things, you know, on your first purchase, there's a difference between the need and what you want. So sometimes you're not gonna be able to get what you really want to have because you need to go through the first step first. Once you have gone through the first step, that first house will get you the house that you wanted. Once you're able to accumulate equity and equity means the difference between what you paid and what you sold for. Now, of course, you have to know when you're selling. But historically, prices of the real estate always have gone up. Right now, we're going through a different situation. And as a matter of fact, I put on my Facebook um, uh, a comparison between 2008 and COVID-19 uh, 2020. And there is a big difference, guys. Everybody thinks that because we're going through this, we're going to see prices of 50% down again. Well, I hope you're right because if you are right and you're waiting to buy your home because you think they're going to come down 50%, please, I beg you, let me know as soon as you know, because I'll be in front of you or next to you competing for the same property. The reality, guys, is that even though right now there are some restrictions to show properties, we are working through virtual realty, meaning just like I'm talking to you, I could be talking to my client, to my buyer, and doing transactions virtually. I can be showing you the house. I could go to the house, right? Because our business became essential two weeks ago. It started to be non-essential. Now it is essential. So I could go, film it on my phone, walk the house, send you the video. We can submit an offer. And we can even do inspections and appraisals because they're still doing it. Of course, everybody, there is disclosures to be signed. Uh, we already had new disclosures where we have to give the buyers, if they want to still go and see the property in person, um, that you are entering the property at your own risk. And there is a disclaimer that you have to sign because we cannot be blamed if you go to a house and then you come back three days later saying, I have contacted, uh, contracted the, the virus. So we are transacting, but we're taking care. Now, the, the amount of property that is in the market uh, is not as many properties right now as it used to be six months ago. But the reason that we're not gonna have the same thing as 2008, where everything went down 50%, is because we don't have enough inventory. We didn't build, for 12 years, we didn't build enough homes for all the people that came to California to leave. So even though you hear that, all people are not are starting not to pay mortgages for barons. Uh, some of them are not going to be able to afford to continue affording the house payments. They're going to be short sales, foreclosures. Yes, it is true. But at the same token, there is another pile of people waiting with money on hands. Because remember, the stock was dropping a few weeks ago. All these people, some of them have cash up and they have the money standing by. Once this is over, you're gonna see that the properties, perhaps there will be a little more inventory, 
but the properties that are going to be coming in will have multiple offers. And when you have multiple offers, that is telling the market that you cannot drop. The prices are not going to drop by itself. Multiple offers means demand, meaning there's not enough homes. Now I have to submit for the same home, and then I have five, six, seven multiple offers. This is what we're going to be facing in a few weeks or months, right? And we're going to get back whatever we lost. And still, we're not going to have enough inventory. So my call to you is, if you are ready to buy, or you know somebody in your family, or your friends that are putting it off, share the news that this is the best time to be buying a property. You're not gonna have to fight with multiple offers. You're getting the best lowest interest you're gonna see. And you can even ask for better terms. There are some properties that have been sitting in the market already for 90 days due to this event, due to COVID-19. So this is the time for you to go and start seeing if you qualify, because now lenders have gotten a little tougher, especially for self-employed guys, right? So what's going on is some of uh, FHA loans now um, have been denied after three weeks that they were told that they were getting a loan. Because now the minimum FICO score you need for FHA is 680. Now, I'm not sure about conventional, um, but they will run around there. And the reason they're starting to increase the credit score is because there, there's not many investors that buy these loans out there because now they are afraid that once they start buying the loans, people are gonna stop paying their mortgage. And remember, the investors that buy your mortgage, they buy hundreds of mortgage in a package. And the reason they invest their money instead of putting on the stock is for you to be able to afford a house. So they make the loan, you put only three and a half percent and they finance the rest of the house. So if this investor cannot get paid their money every month because people are not sending the mortgage payment, how do you expect an investor to get a return on their money? Simple math, guys. If you invest on two units and suddenly now you own it for a year, you've been collecting rents, you have you have cash flow, doesn't matter how much cash flow, you were able to cover your mortgage because you're waiting for the equity that goes up, you know, on the property. And you have a cash flow, 100, 200, 300 dollars. And suddenly this month, your two tenants decide not to pay you because there is news out there saying you don't have to pay the rent if you lost your job, have been laid off, and some people that might be taking advantage of the situation. Now, this is not going to be a free rental. You're gonna have to repay the debt. They started with six months after they officially declared the state and not in a state of emergency or 12 months. So I, I have to find out which one stayed. Because first they said six, then somebody said 12. So we're gonna see if they're giving you 12 months to repay the back rent. But yesterday I was in a conference uh, on the California Association of Realtors. And there's two new forms now that have come out from the California Association of Realtors for us. One of them is to give to our tenants 
a paper to have a conversation of what is going on with your situation. Why are you not paying? Have you lost your job? How much can you pay? I'm sorry to ask you, is anybody listening to me? I mean, can you hear me well? I just from time to time, I, I just, because uh, sometimes the call might drop. Oh, okay, yeah. perfect, perfect, perfect. So this is the form that came out two days ago. Thank you, Sandra. And the other form is the one that the tenant might give you. So if you're a renter right now and you haven't been able to pay your rent, don't be surprised if your landlord knocks your door or sends you a mail, in the mail, a letter saying that we need to get together to fill this out. And this is a document where you're going to have to prove that you're gonna have, you've been laid off, lost your job, are gonna be collecting unemployment, some kind of proof that you don't have your regular job or you have contracted the sickness of COVID and hopefully not, right? And then you're gonna make arrangements to see when or how are you gonna repay the months that you're not gonna be sending the rent. So this came just two days ago. In the past three weeks, guys, every three days, I have different news about different documents being used that we need to use to protect us and the, the buyer and the seller. So I'm trying to give you the news right now. I know this is just um, a real estate course, but I told you that I always try to give you more of what I'm expecting to give. I'm not here to only read the PowerPoint and talk about the definitions. I'm here to also let you know about real estate, what is going on right now, because these are real things. And if you become a realtor, this is what maybe we're gonna go through. And if you have clients that have units, you better know that you can call them and provide value by providing information to them. Do you know how many owners right now or, or landlords, call it investors, landlords, right? They bought their property, they have three, four units, they have their own house, and now they're being faced where tenants are not gonna be able to pay them the whole rent. This person or this landlord is like us. They have a regular mortgage payment. They have to continue paying the back because whatever you're hearing out there, the government is trying to show everybody that, oh yeah, you're not gonna have to pay mortgages. The banks, are, services are gonna give you forbearances and they're gonna put all your payments on the back so you can save the money. Be very aware. I've been following the news for the past two weeks about this event. Be very aware for the ones that have a mortgage. And some of you might have parents and relatives and friends that own a mortgage. And you've heard that, oh yeah, I'm gonna stop paying my rent. I'm gonna stop paying my, my mortgage. Well, before you do, please, I beg you to get help, contact the lender before you start doing that because it could be consequences. It's not like they put it out there. Government is starting to show that they're doing something for us. Yes, they are. But underneath, it's just not one day saying, oh, everybody's gonna go to forbearance. I told you already, there is investors behind those loans. Somebody has to pay the investor. The servicer, has to continue sending the payment to the servicer, even though you're not gonna send your mortgage payment. And that's why the services and the banks right now are trying to get the government to say, listen, just like you have a package out there for unemployment SBA loans, we want to have some money left so you can help us pay these investors and we don't deplete our money, right? And we can keep lending 
so we can keep doing the forbearances the right way. Because I'll tell you one thing. They might tell you, yes, you don't have to pay for the next three months, but they might not be telling you the whole story. So that's why if you don't have it in writing, verbal, on the phone, no valid, guys. It is no good. Because let's say that they give you the forbearance. They say, okay, we'll send you a letter, whatever. They don't tell you that after the three months are over and this is gone and everybody starts going back to work and everything. They are going to demand the three months as a repayment. So now you're gonna have to set up payments between six and 12 months of whatever months you were behind. Another thing is they are saying that they're supposed to keep reporting the same. Well, some services might tell you that and some computers might do something different. So that's why I'm trying to let you know that before you start or you stop payment on your mortgage, you might want to call or try to write to your lender. Now it's very hard to communicate with them on the phone, try to email them. Uh, always there's an account executive, go to the website, there's instructions. Some of them, if you have to fill out the paperwork, start filling it out because they're not gonna do it just because you called and you said, oh, I'm suffering through the COVID-19. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to be proactive here for the ones that have mortgages or if you have relatives that have, you heard that they are thinking of not able to pay. Now, some people are not able to pay because they didn't make any money and they're waiting for the unemployment and the check, right? So, but I just want, I just want you to be aware that whatever they're saying out there, it is true, but you have to find out the details. The secret is in the detail, remember? The secret is in the details. In the little letters that we don't read sometimes. That's what I always talk about the magnifying glass, carry one. Even when you go to a car dealer, sometimes they play our emotions. We say, oh, I'm not gonna spend over $20,000. I don't know what happened, you take seven hours and you get out of the car dealer with almost double the budget that you went. Why? Did you let the salesman convince you to go 20,000 higher? I don't know, but you never read the little letters there, which are the most important ones. Like you cannot bring back the car or you have only one day or two days to make up your mind. So little things that they will not tell us during the process of going to buy a car so leaving it there i just wanted to bring this to you because this is something that a lot of people are trying to find out since if this is the first week or almost going to be the second week of april so i wanted to provide you value by letting you know that you need to be informed and just not stop paying your rent or stop sending your mortgage payments okay uh, for the new people, for the new students trying to join the class, uh, welcome. And, um, you know, we have, uh, you need three courses uh, in order to get your license, guys. Uh, you need real estate practice, a real estate finance course, that's the elective one, and real estate principal course, okay? Um, if you want to register, right, uh, I do have your reviews, um, you know, many of them. And um, also the Saturday class, I want you to understand one thing. If you already complete the Saturday class, the four hours, right? Then you already have one Saturday done. So if you register for Saturday, you only need two more Saturdays and that will be the end of the course. One course, the first one, okay? So this month we're doing real estate principles. Next month, we're going to do the elective, 
which is real estate finance course, right? So you need, until they tell us to go back to the live classes, so far, I don't know anything about it when we're coming back to the classes, to the live classes, but this is the new way right now until the school decides when it's time to go back, right? Or, or the state give us uh, the authorization to start going out. Now, the next one, where is this? Okay, so these are the price options, guys. The in-class, right, would be this one that you're doing. And, and uh, of course, when it comes to the class, you're welcome to go to the class, is $399. Now, um, I don't know about if the $399 includes the books. I believe it doesn't. So that's why underneath it has add-ons because not everybody buys the books, right? So if you don't need the books, then you just pay $399. Now, you also get the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint means the, the things that we're gonna go through. That's the one that you get. And uh, uh, in case you cannot take the class online or live, then you can review the PowerPoint so you know where, you, where we're standing, right? You know, you're supposed to be reading your chapters every class. So like today we're doing the one, the two, the three, the four and five chapters basically. And um, also there is payment plans that they can give you. So you have a three month payment plan if you decide to go this way. If you're short of money and you can have to use this, there's no problem. You can talk to the school. Now I don't basically my job is to give you the real estate course and I'm the instructor. Uh, technical things and about the books, whatever has to be dealt with the, with the school directly. So if you go to the website, they're very accessible. They have chats, uh, emails, and uh, you can call them as well, okay? But this is the plan guys uh, for the new uh, students that are trying to join. You can go to, uh, to where it says uh, carrealtytraining.com. And if the system accepts, um, you know, your application, it means there's still room for Saturday. So then you can join. And then today would be one day of class. So you would only need two more, two more Saturdays and you finish the course and then can take the final test for the, the chapter, okay? So I just wanted to let you know that, uh, let's see. Mm. Okay, guys, um, any questions before I, I go into the course? Everybody's clear? Okay. So let me go back to what we're going to talk today. So this month we're talking about real estate principles in... Uh, Okay, so guys, who are the players uh, in real estate? We need to remind this every month. Uh, the players basically, you already know, are the buyers, the sellers, uh, the real estate agents, lenders, escrow, uh, home inspectors, appraisers. So basically when you have a real estate transaction, there is a lot of people involved in one transaction, okay? Um, the The... The part where I like to um, spend a little time is on prospecting, guys. Because I keep telling you, uh, prospecting means there's another word that we use, uh, which is called lead generation. And if you wanna, you're used to use abbreviations and not write too many words, then we can call it a lead gen, okay? So let's talk about lead gen or lead generation. And um, this is the way, guys, that you're going to have to really think about it because real estate is not an easy business. You're going to have to learn through the process, uh, train yourself, like I always keep saying. But if you don't prospect, 
if you don't talk to people, if you don't join some kind of clubs, if you don't have material to share with people about not only a house, but a different thing, like I told you last time, Proposition 60, Proposition 90, down payment assistance, different things, right? It is going to be very hard for you to be successful in real estate. Because in reality, this business is about building relationships. You're not getting a license to go open the door and show a house, even though that's one of our, you know, duties. Uh, you don't need to sell the house, basically. The house will sell by itself, right? But what you need to really know and wherever you're going to distinguish yourself is how much knowledge, how professional you are becoming in front of your clients. Are you training yourself? Are you keeping updated with all the information, uh, the new information in the field? Because they come to you for advice. That's what I'm saying. I don't call myself a real estate agent. I call myself a trusted advisor because that's what I become to my clients, a trusted advisor. And that's the ultimate goal for you guys when you start. You want them when you meet this buyer or this seller on your first meeting to leave an impression. You got to be assertive, professional, commanding, because you're going to show them that you are they're looking for you to be able to help them do whatever real estate need they have, either buy, sell, uh, you know, a property or invest on units, depending on what niche you're trying to work on, right? But you have to really make it and show them that you know your stuff. And if you don't, it's okay. You're not going to be able to answer every question all the time or every time. When you don't know a question that they ask you, the easiest way is to respond, Mr. Smith, Mr. Buyer, this is a very good question. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to get back to you by tomorrow. Is that okay? I need to ask my broker about this one. I don't want to answer you something I'm not sure about. Because it's best if you have that excuse, right? And it shouldn't be excuse, it's the truth. Then trying or pretending to answer every question so they can say, oh yeah, I know about the stuff, I know. Because people will know it like this if you really know the answer or not. So be honest, be you, be yourself. Always showing professionalism. And it's okay. I'm 36 years in the business and I don't know all the questions. Even though every day I'm learning through my agents what's going on, that's what they call me. Victor, what do I do this situation? Or oh, what form do I need to use? Do we use this form? Now, my buyer doesn't want to, um, you know, the seller doesn't want to return the deposit even though my buyer didn't remove the contingencies. A lot of things. That's why it's so important, guys. And you have to understand before you get into this business that you're going to have to go to school and learn about real estate. And you're going to have to interview different offices, right? Different brokers, two or three offices, before you select one to see what they offer. And please, please, I just hope that the first question or one of the first questions that you ask is not about how much commission you're going to offer me or your office offers. That question shouldn't even be coming on the first interview. The main question that you, it, it should be from you should be, what are you going to do for me? I'm a new agent. What kind of classes you have? 
how many trains you offer a week, do you have mentors, do you have personal coaches, what does it entail, what is your office doing for me? That is the main thing that you need to go and interview. And believe me, if you leave that office or that interview and you never ask about what is the compensation, believe me, that manager or broker will be calling you every day for you to come and select their office because they know that you are motivated to learn, to go to school and learn every process in order to become a professional realtor. Okay, I just always like to bring that. Yes, you will make money in real estate if you do the activities. If you don't do the activities and you have all this knowledge, but you don't bring a client to work with, usually it will take you perhaps six months to bring your first client, which is quite all right. In the meantime, some of you will start part-time because you work other jobs and some of you will start full-time. So if you're full-time, I think, it is not uncommon to see on the fourth month already you working with a client. And that's what I keep telling you. Start talking to people, even while you're taking the classes. Be excited about this. Just talk in a way where, hey, you're about to get your license tomorrow. Share your enthusiasm. Don't think, oh, people don't care. People, you know, why I'm bothering. No, don't think like that. Because remember, whatever you think is already done, you already declare it, it's, it's going to be like that. Same people, oh, I'm never going to door knock. Well, then you'll never door knock. You already declare it. You're not going to door knock. I'm not good at talking on the phone. Then you're not going to be good at talking off the phone. So unconsciously, we are telling ourselves we're not good for something. Do you know in the last three and a half years with the students that have joined the class, I mean the class, the office. And they said to me, oh, I'm not good at doing open houses, not doing door knockings, whatever. Guess where the first deal came from? From the same thing that they denied themselves already without even trying. And they were so successful at it. And guess what? That's what they're doing. So don't underestimate yourself. Sometimes that's what we do to ourselves. We underestimate our skills. Oh, no, I cannot do it before even trying it. You listen to yourself. Don't listen to the other people that might tell you, oh, you're not going to be good at it. You should do this. You're not going to be good at it. Try it. So in that way, you know, yes, definitely I'm not good at this. I'm going to try now the new thing. But don't that's just stop doing the activities because somebody told you that you're not good at it or you're never going to be good at it. You decide yourself. It is your business. It becomes your business. And if that's the problem, prove to other ones that yes, you can do it. So I want you to start thinking about grabbing more the phone, calling on your sphere of influence. You have on your phone 100 to 150 people, if not more. Oh, Victor, I don't like talking on the phone, you know, now. I like to send text messages where, you know, uh, little letters, you know, TVK, IVK. And by the way, I'll tell you one thing. Last year, you know, um, my kids, they used to send me all these texts and with abbreviated words. And I tell you, I still have to learn to write texts with maybe three words. I understand the millennials, I understand generation Z, X, Y, whatever generation that we're trying to cut corners. Uh, that's fine with me, I'm, I'm learning about it. But in, you know, in my business, in this business, it is difficult to send a message to a buyer with three words. Because in that way, all the lingo words 
in the real estate, then I'm going to have to start using it. Mr. Smith, please sign on the RPA, and then you have to fill out the TDS, SPQ, and the audit. How would you like for me to send you a message like that? You're going to say, what the heck is Victor talking about? So what I was telling you about my kid is then he starts sending me messages with three, three words. And uh, to tell you the truth, you know, I use social media. I'm not so much into it, but, you know, um, I didn't know what IDK was. Which now I understand is I don't know. Or ILV. Or see you later. S, Y, whatever. So it is not familiar to me because I don't use it every day. You guys, I mean, uh, my kid maybe use it every day with their friends, whatever. But so I tell them, listen, at least, you know, I had to start asking in the office to see if they knew about it. That's how I learned. But I don't like to talk to my kids on by text. I mean, certain things, yes. So they know they have to call me if they want to ask for something. And they always do especially if they have to ask for money. Believe me, I'll get that call. And then I don't answer the phone. I'll just, I'll just send a text. And I send the letters. IDK, I don't have money, so I abbreviate. So in that way, you know, we understand each other. Right? But the point, guys, is there is activities in real estate that you're going to have to try. So don't start your career saying, I cannot do this. I'm not good at this. Try it. Best way to start your real estate career once you have your license is either call on the people that you know, it's fear of influence. Do open houses. You're going to shadow somebody at the beginning, but you can do open houses. Because the people that visit open houses more likely are going to be buying between maybe two to three months or six months, some of it. But you can start getting leads. And the door knocking, you're going to do it the day that you're going to do the open house. So you go one hour and a half early and you start going around that open house, around the house, two blocks maybe, inviting people. Hey, I'm having my open house at 12 o'clock. This is going to be cookies, water, ice cream, whatever you want to say, if you have some. I'll invite you, please. Come on in. So you're letting know people. You're not soliciting. You're inviting people. That's the door knocking. Some people go and door knock certain areas, especially the ones that they know and they're familiar with, right? And that's how they get the business. They just go and give some kind of information, good information about, could be a down payment assistant. You know that some people are renting. In our neighborhood, some of them are renting. So you might give the information to the renter. So now maybe they are ready to buy a home or you can and, you know, enlist them in the uh, road to home ownership. And that's how you're going to start meeting people. So that's what I'm going to talk about prospecting, guys. Without prospecting, there is no real estate. I can teach you everything I know about real estate. But what good is it going to be if you don't bring a client and then we, you start doing, you're doing by learning. I mean, you're learning by doing. So you need to have building relationships, a skill in order to do this business. So I just want you to let you know up front so there is no disappointments. And, you know, if after six months you haven't talked to no one, I can guarantee you, you're not going to make it in real estate. Now, it could be that you're getting your license not to become a realtor. It could be that you're getting your license to maybe be a property manager, um, an investor, an appraiser, mortgage consultant. There's more different things you can do with a license. Okay. Even if you want to save a commission on your own, maybe you own three, four properties and when you sell them, you don't want to pay commission to agents. So now you, you can sell it your own and just pay the commission to whoever brings the offer. That's another way people get the, their, their license. Okay? So let, let's move on. The business of real estate, guys. Now, 
Let's talk about administration of real estate law. We have the Department of Real Estate. That's what DRE is for, Department of Real Estate, right? It's a division of uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs and they administers and manages the real estate law. Now, the real estate commissioner is appointed by the governor. So who appoints the real estate commissioner? The governor, okay? That would be basically a question on the test. So you might know, you might know that. Now, please remember, um, if you have questions, ask me on chat. I'll be glad to answer them. Um, what is their mission, guys? The mission is to safeguard and promote the public interest in real estate matter through licensure, regulation, education, and enforcement. That's basically the mission of the Department of Real Estate. Okay. Now, who are or oh, what is the Real Estate Advisory Commission composed of? Basically, it had to be 10 members. 10 members are chosen by the real estate commissioner, right? Six of them, they must have a real estate broker license. And then four of them should be members from the public. And that advisory, that commission should have and has the power to adopt, amend, and revoke licenses under the real estate law. So if you're trying to help and if you do something to a consumer and they sue you, basically they will be deciding what's gonna happen with your license, okay? But uh, I just wanted to let you know their position. Okay, uh, real estate commissioner, I believe right now is Sandra Now, which is uh, the current acting real estate commissioner. Uh, they might ask you this question on the test, but uh, Mr. Wayne Bell was uh, the previous from February to July, 2018. Um, I think they have over 400,000 licensees. Now, what I can tell you is I noticed a lot, a lot of people in the last four months um, trying to get their licenses to become realtors. So I believe we're going to see an increase uh, in, in the uh, uh, realtors, but don't worry. It doesn't matter how many realtors we have. You know what it matters? That if you do the activities, you will get your own clients, regardless of how many realtors they are. If you do a superb customer service, if you become a professional, if you become a trusted advisor for a buyer, for a seller, for an investor, right? They will follow you. Your services will be in demand because I wanna make sure that you understand you're not getting a license to show a house. You're, let, you're getting a license to be able to serve people, to give them and provide them with the right information to educate yourself because they're gonna come to you as the resource that they need in order to uh, make that American dream possible. And every time, every time, because until now, every time somebody, I help somebody to close a transaction, believe me, that feeling of achievement and that feeling of happiness, just to see uh, this family is so happy and you can see it on their faces that finally, after 15 years of renting, you help them make this possible. And now they're walking into their single level or two level home with their own backyard. You can see the happiness even on the kids. And that's what makes your job so valuable. And that's why people will keep referring you if you did a good job. Now, just by saying that, I have to let you know, there is good apples, there is medium apples, and there is bad apples in the business. And unfortunately, some bad apples give us bad reputation to all the agents. And for the same reason, we need to prepare ourselves to become professionals, educated, so when they meet us, they say, wow, this is a real thing. This is a professional. I don't know what they're talking out there. 
I just want you to be aware that you're going to find different kind of realtors. Some of them don't follow procedures. Some of them don't care about their clients. They just want to close the transaction. And some of them, they will love this business that you'll notice it. They have the passion. I'll tell you, I'm very passionate about my business. And that's why I always disclose and tell you that sometimes my voice raises, rises, you know, and I don't want you to, I don't think that I'm reprimanding you. It's just the passion coming up. Because I still believe through my teaching, through my uh, sharing of knowledge, I can form a good realtor out there. So they can continue helping the people, right? To achieve that American dream. Because we're not going to be replaced by robots like people are telling us. Look, now we're starting to do virtual. But they cannot do a virtual if they don't have a realtor in front of you, right? That guiding you and showing you how to do things. Documents, how can you sign? Okay, you send the documents and you start explaining just like I'm teaching you. So in that way, they become educated. They know what they're signing. It's not just, oh, Mr. Smith, I quickly need you to sign these documents because otherwise they're going to cancel our transaction. We were supposed to send it three days ago. So please, I'm going to send you DocuSign. Just receive the 15 pages go to the bottom of the page, initial each page and sign page 10. You even know the, the page number he has to sign. But you don't know that you're supposed every document to explain the person. Now you don't have to read every word, but you have to know what are those documents. That's why you became a realtor. That's why you have a license. At least read the contract and let him know and pinpoint the main things they need to know about what they're signing about. Oh, I'll explain later, just initial whatever, so in that way, and then I'll meet with you in two days to go over the forms. And some agents never call back. You know why I'm telling you this? Because the courts, the judges are telling us that that's the complaint, number one complaint with the buyers and sellers in the last year and a half. Oh, my agent never got together with me. He never explained the forms in its entirety. I didn't know what he was signing. He just said, sign here, sign there. I'll explain later. So now they're not blaming so much the broker, me, because I'm responsible for you. Now, which I love it, now they start blaming the realtor because you are supposed to be doing your job. And what is your job? Your job is not to get a license, just to get a license. Your job is to educate once you have the license and be always on the current information, be knowledgeable about it and explain to the buyer, to the seller, Anything that you need to sign, you just sit like a professional and you go over it. And if they have questions, you can answer. At every transaction, I do that with my clients. Do you think I read every paragraph? No, I don't have the time. But I guarantee you, if you come and I meet you and I help you in a transaction, you're going to come out from that meeting with a general knowledge of what you sign. And still, if you have more questions, I'll answer it for you 24 hours if you want. But you're not going to have more questions because I have built my trust in you and you are trusting me. And I don't abuse that trust. And that's the whole thing. That the buyers, as a matter of fact, I, I found this phrase and I'm sure you have, uh, you have heard about this one. Let me see. Uh, I wrote it last night because I've been saying it, but I want to say it the right way. 
and it has to do when you meet your clients. This is the one. There's an old say that says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? I'm sure you have heard that. And that's the truth. That's why you meet people the first time. They need to find out from you what you know, what are you going to do for them, and if you really care about helping them or making a $15,000 commission. And believe me, when you come from dollar sign contribution, they will see it in you. And good luck if they come back to you. But when they see it from the point of view that you want to give your knowledge, you're very detailed how you explain what they're supposed to know. Because some buyers don't know nothing about it. They have heard different news from different people. But now they're hearing directly from a licensed realtor. And if you're not prepared for that, if you don't want to go to school, if you don't want to have a mentor because you don't want to share the commission or whatever, then you're in the wrong field. It is going to be a very rocky road for you in real estate. And you will not be at your best and you will not be helping a lot of people the right way. Because there is the right way and the wrong way. Do you know that I have students that decide to become a realtor. Why? Because they have a bad experience with a realtor themselves. I love it. I completely love it. Because I can assure you that that student that had an experience, now they're going to learn how to treat a buyer. And they're very successful in their career. So I applaud the people or those students that maybe they didn't have the experience they wanted to have. Now they want to give it to somebody else. And for that, you need to get trained and educate yourself. Okay. In the real estate. Uh, okay. Okay. So the real estate brokerage in general, um, when you get a license, guys, you're going to, even if you get the license by yourself, you're not going to be able to be selling real estate unless you put it under a brokerage. You need a real estate brokerage in order to perform activities, period. That's it, okay? So a salesperson can do business only as an employee of the broker. So remember this. If you join a real estate brokerage, for the brokerage, you are an employee. But for the IRS, you are a self-employed or 1099. Okay? So I want you to know the difference, right? You will always get a 1099 at the end of the year of all the commissions that you collected. And you will have to do your own taxes as a self-employed. Okay? Now, when you hand your new license with the brokerage, you will be representing them in the real world. Right. So although you are an independent contractor, you are representing the name of the brokerage. So my question to you is, and I hope I can see some answers. If you go and take a listing, who do the listing belongs to? Can you guys let me know? Anybody? Okay, it belongs to the brokerage. Yes, Annalie, thank you. It belongs to the brokerage. So let's say you get three listings and you need to leave the agency because you move from wherever you were living and you want to now get to another agency uh, nearby your home, right? Can you take those listings with you? 
you will not be able to take those listings with you. Exactly, Kevin. You cannot. However, listen to this. However, even though it stays with the brokerage, right? It's not even the brokers. It's just the brokerage, right? If they close, you will get paid whatever agreement you had with your broker. Just so you know. Nobody is going to take your work away. But the listing remains with the brokerage. You can move to another office. Yes. But you cannot take the listings. Now, I tell you, you have to be very careful if you ever do that. If you go back to the sellers and tell them, listen, seller, I had to move and, you know, I moved to another office. I just need to update the record and the listing now belongs to the other office. You have to be very careful what you do because if you already had the listing for two months and the total days of listing was 90 days, right? What happens is he might, the seller might say, you know what, Victor? I'm not going to renew. So if you have to leave to go, I think I'm going to cancel the listing. And you might lose the listing completely. So my advice is never try to move the listings to another office unless it is your relative or you know him. Because the chances are that you might lose the deal at all. Anyways, so leave it where it is. Perhaps somebody makes an offer and you're still going to get paid the percentage amount that you negotiate, okay? Um, yeah, Kevin, if you move from Chino Hills, Keller Williams to a new KW, is the same thing, you know. Uh, you have to leave it here, and then, because every office usually is owned individually. It's own offices individually owned and operated, okay? Okay. That's a good question. Now, what are the activities, guys, that you do when you have your license? You're going to be able to sell houses, condominiums, mobile homes, manufactured homes, business opportunity, commercial property. Yes, Annalie, take more training classes. That's right. And the real estate area that is typically chosen by new licenses is realty property and residential homes. Now with this, you can also sell units. You can sell two units, three units, four units, right? Or commercial, which is five plus. But you have to make sure that on every office, they have, like for example, this office, we don't do property management. Now, you can lease the property. You can help somebody to lease a property. So all you do is you procure a tenant, right? And you make your commission on a lease. But you cannot do the activities of property management because the error and omission will not cover you. So it depends on the office and it depends what the office services are. So always ask what, what, what do they do? Some, they don't do commercial. So it's a strictly residential, okay? Okay, guys, then what are the, my responsibilities? One of my responsibilities is maintain all real estate licenses active. So 90 days before your license expire, you better believe it, I'm gonna be behind you and sending you notices saying, eh, eh, in 90 days, your license will expire. Why? Because if you let it lapse, you're not going to lose the license right there. When you are a real estate sales or a real estate agent, if you don't pay the fee or you don't renew your license, you have one year, only one year, to go back, pay the fee, and just continue. But if you let the year pass by, sorry, you have to take the courses again and take the test again. And I don't think you want to do that. I also have students that are coming back because three, four, five years they had a license. They didn't want to pay the renewal. Now they decided to continue real estate. Now they have to take the class and take the test again. So I hope that's not your case ever. 
So that's what, uh, you know, every three months. Now, let's say that you have two transactions and you forgot to renew your license. You didn't check your email. You didn't know you were so busy, whatever, whatever you want to say. And then you're about to close a transaction next week and your license expires this coming Monday. Guess what? If it expires and you don't renew it right away, the transaction continues, closes. The broker cuts the checks, one for you, one for the office. Your check will be waiting there for the time that you take in to renew the license. Nobody will take your money. The money is there, but you cannot grab it because you don't have a license to perform. So I want you to make sure that you understand this. So set up your calendars. Now these phones are powerful. You know, you can set it up in three years and let you know, hey, Victor says it's time of renewal. You know, because you want to do this 90 days before. Now, if you want to do it eight months before, the is going to tell you too soon. Usually it's within 90 days of expiration. So you have to order a course online and then you can do it online, take 45 hours education and then you renew it, you pay your fee, that's it. Another four years, okay? Now, the second thing I do is supervise the sales associates, you know, go over to transaction, check that you are submitting the right forms and all that. And for the test, how many years I have to retain the file of a customer, of a transaction, three years. Three years, the office by law has to retain. Now, you have your own copy, you can retain it forever if you want, but the office is three years, okay? Of course, I like to keep it five years, you never know, but three years is what the test is gonna ask you. This is the car, guys, that you're gonna get once you pass your test. Now, some of you, once you pass your test, you're gonna get a letter with a car saying NBA, N as in Nancy, B as in boy, A as in up. NBA means no broker assigned. So when you send your request for a test, you never fill out the brokerage you were going to, then what's gonna happen is they send you the, the letter saying you pass the test, congratulations. They send you the card, but it will say no broker assigned. Now you have to select the brokers you're going to go to work to, go meet the broker. The broker now has to fill out another application similar to the one that you send the request for the test date, right, for the state test. And now he has to sign. And with that one, it will take another four to six weeks to get it back so you can start selling real estate. So if you can know where you're going before you go to take the test and you put it there, then when you pass the test, you basically, within 18 days, you're ready to go to work. So if you have already two clients waiting for you because you've been very active on the phones while you were studying and calling and you know talking to people, telling them I'm about to get my license, whatever, and you won't be able to work with those uh, potential leads. Why? Because you didn't select the brokerage when you sent for the test day. Nothing wrong with it. It just wanted to let you know that that's the time it takes, okay? Because you cannot transact without a license, period. Okay, so what are the requirements, guys? In becoming a real estate agent, at least 18 years old, unless you are emancipated, honest and truthful. You have to take three courses. We already talked about it. Uh, pass the salesperson exam, seven examination, get fingerprinted, right? Pay required license fee. You will complete the 45 hours of continuing education every four years and obey applicable laws and regulations. So that's basically what you have to do, okay? Now, if you ever want to become a broker, basically it's just take a, uh, uh, complete uh, eight college level courses, similar to the ones that you have. So you will need four more to complete basically. 
and then pass the broker license. I'll tell you, in order to pass nowadays the broker license, the passing ratio uh, is around 35 to 39% of the people that takes the broker license. For the real estate license, it's around 42 to 45% uh, of agents that pass the test. Now, I can tell you that because this course is gonna give you a thousand questions, right, to study, after you finish the certificate, if you don't finish the test and get the certificates, the dashboard will not open for you the 1,000 questions uh, to study from, right? So a majority of my students have called me and say, Victor, I passed my test. And one of my questions has been, did you have to go to a, a real estate crash course or did you pass just studying the questions and getting 80 to 90% before you go uh, when to take the test. And that's the answer usually, that they just study all the questions, the thousand questions, they retake the test time and time until they got 85 to 90% of the score. So in reality, they didn't need to go to a real estate crash course, but the school offers one at the discount since you're already paying for the course. So maybe you wanna consult with them and see uh, what day is. Usually you should do the crash courses is Saturday and Sunday, and you should do it the week, the weekend before you're taking your test the following week, okay? Okay, what else? Uh, we already talked about that. Okay, who enforces a real estate law? Uh, to have a flourishing real estate career, it's important to stay out of legal trouble. That should be the goal at all times. And that's why you need education. Do not break any laws. If you do, the Real Estate Commission will investigate. You will have a hearing in the court. Uh, administrative uh, law judge presides. A licensee may have an attorney. And if they prove charges uh, that you committed something, a uh, mistake or uh, you violated the law, uh, then the license may be suspended or revoked or the license may be fucked. okay? So always do it the right way and you will go a long way, right? That's what they say. Okay, this is the Department of Real Estate, guys. Um, do you have this one on your books or no? Well, I mean, are you familiar? Have you tried to go into the, the can you see the website? Can you let me know if you're seeing what I'm doing? Because I know you cannot hear unless I do something, but um, uh, can you see this website? Yeah, okay, perfect. So when are you gonna use this website? This website is good for, okay, thank you, Anna. Um, this is good guys, because when I get an offer on any of my listings, the first thing I do is I wanna know if I'm working with a, uh, licensed realtor, right? So I go and I'm gonna go to verify license and I'm gonna put the last name or if on the form, usually they give you the uh, license number, right? So let me see, I think I remember my license number, 00960977. My goodness, that, that must be an old license. I'm not that old though, but um, let's see. Okay, so here, as you can see, this is mine. So I'm pretending I'm checking the broker, right? And my concern is expiration date. So I see that my license expired next September. So I still have a year left, more than a year, right? I'm licensed and as you can see, I became broker 1993, and I was just like you, a real estate salesperson uh, in 87. So it took me six years to go and pass the test, take the classes. And the reason I have a broker license, I could say is because my mother since 87 didn't stop telling me, go and get your license, broker license, broker license for six years. Guys. So I had to stop the seven year, you know? So I said, I'm gonna do it. I prefer, I got it. I never heard of it again, okay. This is what I'm looking for, guys. Look at this. Am I doing something right for 36 years? I think so. 
So if you just want to know, you're being trained with somebody that basically do the job the right way, okay? But this is what you're looking for on the agents. And uh, the other thing you might use the website is for news guides. There's uh, news, they give you a newsletter. Uh, let's see, where, where do I get from here? Okay, so this is, as you can see, there is information for consumers to tell you about home buyers, filing a complaint, uh, consumers guide and publications, any scams uh, out there. So it has a lot of information for the public as well, not only for the real, okay? But this is a good source of information for you and you can check it out on your own and find it, okay? Okay, so we covered that. Okay, brain game. So a neutral third party, that protects the integrity of the transaction. What is that, guys? It is escrow, right? The former chief officer of the DRE, Wayne Bell, held what position? Real estate commissioner. A salesperson is considered an employee of the brokerage. Remember that, the brokerage, okay? A brokerage holds transaction records for this amount of time. So how many years? I'm supposed to keep your records or the brokerage or the office. Three years, okay? Now, what are the three required courses needed to become a salesperson? Principles, practice, and an elective, right? And an applicant must submit one set of fingerprints electronically to who? That would be the Department of Justice. So once you fill out your form for the state test, then you're gonna have your fingerprints and I will be going directly to the Department of Justice, okay? Okay, guys, so we're done with session one. Let's quickly go to session two, and then we can have a break. Let me see, I need to know. So we are 10 people, okay, good. Uh, okay, so chapter two talks about the nature of real estate. By the way, do you have, anybody has a question on the first uh, session, on the first chapter? Is everybody clear about that? Okay, I guess so. I don't see many questions today. Okay. The nature of real estate. Um, a little bit of geography for California. Uh, we are the third largest state uh, in land, uh, you know, and then uh, almost 40 million people, right? 40 million people. So I'm sure that you guys are familiar with uh, most, uh, some surrounding areas and different cities and everything, right? Now, the history of California um, became uh, Mexican-American War began in uh, May, 1846. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed in 1848. That's when the war with Mexico ended. And California became a state when? In 1850, guys. 1850 became uh, a state, okay? And at that time, 1849, I think San Francisco had the golden rush. So a lot of people uh, became millionaires and everybody went down there to look for gold. Uh, and that went up from 500, uh, citizens to almost a uh, population of 150,000, right? So anyways, now I'm sure that some of you have uh, heard about the effect of the housing bubble. This is what it was called, um, you know, back in 2007 and 2008. But usually from the 60s and 70s, uh, we have kept modest values in, in homes, right? Uh, until uh, the 70s to the 2000s that really spiked up. All the prices went up. Um, mortgage companies have been easing a little bit the credit. So more people have been able to qualify uh, for the mortgages, right? Now, the boom years ended uh, between the 2007, 2008. For some of you that want to know what happened during that bubble and uh, like I said, I published something, uh, the difference between 2008 and COVID 2020 to see the difference. 
you know, that is not the same market. And we're not going to have 50% reduction in, in sales price on properties. But uh, there is a movie in Netflix called The Big Short. The Big Short, right? So you're welcome to check it out and watch the movie. It tells you basically what happened at that time and how the whole bubble started, okay? So it's very interesting anyways. Now, as you can see, the California median price, slight growth, right? Bounced back over 600 now since May, 2014. So back in December, 2019, we were looking at median price of around California, $615,000, guys. So it was an increase of 4.3 month to month and a 10.3% year to year, right? Um, but look, look, look at the uh, 2008, 2007 was the top, right? $600,000. And then next, the following year just came down drastically to almost half percent. You see the, the arrow here, almost leading to 250, 300. And then has been going up, down, up, down, up, down. But eventually since 2009, this has been going up and we had some years in which, you know, we went down, but then we come back really quickly. And now we are at almost the same level as 2007. So right now we are kind of adjusting in certain areas, the prices, uh, banks are adjusting a little bit, but because we don't have that much inventory, as soon as this is over, we're gonna see these prices coming back quickly equity is coming back because there's not many properties and there's a lot of buyers are waiting right now for the government to say, go out. And now people are going to start and resume their own life, protecting themselves, whatever, following the guidelines. But now you're going to start seeing people making offers. That's what I started the course this morning. And I told you about that this is the best time to buy. They will have no competition. You, have, you can even negotiate with the sellers to lower the interest rate. Let's say, let's say that you don't lower the price, right? You don't lower the price, but you can ask him if he can help you lower the credit. So meaning that if you qualify right now by 5% or four and a half, if you pay an extra point, the bank will have to lower your rate to maybe from four and a half to four percent. You can ask the seller, hey, can you help me with two, three points, right, to lower my rate instead of me making an offer on your house? Because what you really want to, if you're going to remain in your home, for the next five to seven years, then you don't need to worry so much about lowering the price because you're gonna make it up. You're worrying about securing that mortgage payment at the lowest possible interest rate. So you can ask the seller to help you pay points. So you pay the points to the lender. So the lender, if you start at four and a half, maybe you can lower to almost 3.75 with the help of the seller. Does it make that sense? Yes, it does. But if you're going to wait until properties still come down, you're going to be competing with everybody else. And if you are buying with 3.5%, 5%, 10%, the chances of acquiring the property or winning the bid against somebody that has 20, 30, 50% because they already have the money waiting for the market to start coming back, then you're going to lose every time. So this should be the best time if you are in the market to buy a property right now, okay? Okay. And if you don't have a realtor, you know who to call, right? Not Ghostbusters, but Victor Hugo, right? I can help you. Okay, and you'll learn, by the way. 
Uh, look at the median home prices, guys, by county. Let's say LA County. Look at LA County back in 1983. You could buy a regular three, two, but maybe 1,500, 1,200 property, 5,000 lot for $118,000. Have you seen lately those properties in LA? Horrendous prices. But just in December 2019, they were at 641. And some of the one I'm looking at, they have been rehabbed completely and they're selling them between 700, 700, 725. Lots of them. The price have increased dramatically. Now, Anali, I have a question here. Are the interest rates going up or down right now? Or is it a standstill due to COVID-19? Well, let me tell you, interest rates are starting to go up a little bit for the same reason I explained to you that lenders are not able to lock many um, loans at the beginning when the start, when the uh, consumer goes and apply for a loan because there's investors that are waiting to see what's gonna happen uh, with the government helping the servicers uh, because of all these def deferments. So, so they're still low, but I heard last week went just a little bit up, not much difference, right? But this is the best time I think that the interest rate is gonna be uh, at the rate that that it is right now okay now look at thank you for the question look at orange orange used to be worth a standard median price 131 in 1983 guys look at this now eight hundred and forty thousand dollars who knew that orange county back in 1983 was going to be able to go seven times the price of a regular home. And this is just a regular home. I'm not talking about these mansions that uh, you know they have over there, right? Now look San Diego, same thing, $100,000, 655. Look San Francisco, 133, went up to 1.45. Who knew that Google and uh, eBay and all these gurus you know, were gonna go down there and set up businesses and hire everybody paying $250,000 per year or more and then jump in the prices of home because they wanna leave clothes by their job, right? So real estate guys is the best investment that you can put your money on. And if you get into this real estate career, I hope that within two years, one of your goals is to own either your home, but if you already have your home, start buying two units, three units, so you can get some cash flow. That's how you're gonna get really the equity and the cash flow. Because according to statistics, I don't think we're gonna have a very uh, fatty social security. Every year, they just trying to see if they're gonna increase the age where you're gonna be able to collect your social security, right? I think I was supposed to collect it at 62, now I think I have to wait until 67. And if I wait until 72, I'm gonna get the max of 2,500 or something like that. You know, I'm not even thinking about it. Because how much would it be? I don't know, right? But real estate is the best asset that you can put your money on. Okay, guys, the bundle of rights. You need to know this for sure. It will be on the text. So the bundle of rights are the benefits of home ownership. So you need to know, and we came out with a phrase where you can remember quickly, and we put it up T, U-P-T-E-E, -E, up T, okay? So the U stands for use, which means that the owner has the right to use the property as he wishes, of course, in a lawful way. Now they put lawfully because nowadays there's people buying homes to cultivate, I don't wanna call the regular word, I'm just gonna put the word that is being used lately, cannabis, right? They just set up the closet, the walking closet, whatever, and then suddenly you have a neighbor that weird smell is coming from the houses 
and all the neighbors, you can hear the laughs, screamings and all that. So then that's what's going on. Uh, I heard of stories that in Eastvale, I believe in Corona, they found nobody knew about it. Nobody thought about it, even on gated communities, uh, you know, townhouses, that this case last week or last month uh, of an agent, the grandma was leasing, bought the property and he was listening to the grandchildren. What happened to be that the grandchildren, because the grandma didn't live in the townhouse, right? The grandchildren were producing or cultivating, whatever you want to call it, cannabis, and they were more than six plants. I heard the six plants is okay, right? But after that, it's just like kind of a factory or manufacturing. So, and then the neighbors started smelling kind of weird and they called the police. So now police came, they raided the place, they put the yellow tag, they found the place and they found on every single room and walking closet, lights, outlets, electrical things. I mean, the house could blow up anytime with all the electrical stuff. And the grandma didn't know anything about it. Now, they have to prove that or not, but you know, it's the grandchildren that were living there and renting the place. And the agent that helped to buy the townhouse, uh, the owner was in another country. And after that, you know, he had to clean the place. I think he, he had to pay, I don't know, to the city, whatever. But the agent come to me and says, Victor, uh, now the seller wants me to sell the place. And now it's been fixed, whatever. If I list the place, do I have to disclose that there was um, a plantation of cannabis being grown in the property, whatever? But of course, how are you not going to disclose if it's a material fact and the whole neighbor knows about it? Can you believe if you just list the property and nobody checks your transaction, you sell it to someone? Guess who they're going to find the information the very first day? Neighbors are just waiting for that home buyer to move in and knock their door. And they're not gonna, in California, it's not used, you know, other states, I think they do. But in California, it is not used to bring you a pie, saying, welcome to the neighborhood, right? They just don't knock and say, oh, I wanted to introduce myself, I'm the neighbor. By the way, did you know this house was raided or marijuana, whatever? Oh my God, when did this happen? My agent never told me anything. Oh my God, he never told you anything? You can sue the agent right now. How are you not going to disclose a material fact that it just happened and you were aware of it? So that question should be asked from an agent. Because nowadays it's not location, location, location. Nowadays it's about disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. If you already know that something went on, when you fill out your paperwork, you have to make, and you have to ask the seller, please disclose what you already know, because somebody's gonna come and live here. What about if he doesn't disclose, they rent the property? What about if the previous tenants owe money to somebody? And that somebody finds out where you live, pretending that they're the old tenants, they come back and they might hurt you. You're gonna have to disclose to the new buyer anything that you know about the property that is material fact. Death, you disclose in the last three years. So the seller is supposed to disclose that somebody died of natural cause, you know, or whatever was the motive, but you're supposed to disclose within three years. Okay. Now, going back to the bundle of rights, because that would be a question on the text. Bundle of rights are U stands for use, P possess, which is the right to live on the property and exclude others. The T, as a Thomas, T is transfer, the right to sell it, will it, and gift it, right? Now you have the right, the next is E, which is stands for encumber, 
which is the right to use the property as security to borrow funds. And the last one is another E, which is enjoy, the right to enjoy the property without interference from others. So I ask you please to uh, remember this because this will be on the test. Now, one way to get these definitions that we go over the PowerPoint guys is the easiest way. Go to 99 cents or $1 stores, whatever, buy those dollar indexes cards, the index cards, and start writing, you know, these definitions. Keep it on your purse, keep it on, on your back, whatever you use. And then on your lunch time, if you have the time, just go in and review the definitions. The more you look at them and, and read the definitions, the faster you're going to have it here. So when it's ready to take the test, it will be so easy because you are going to remember this and you don't have to think it over every question on the, on the test. As soon as you see it, oh, up T, and you answer all of the above and you move to the other. So that's the idea of why you want to practice the definitions that you see here on the uh, PowerPoints, okay? Now, let's talk about real versus pro uh, personal property, guys, okay? Uh, you know that real property is immovable, right? It's like land, land is immovable. Is anything attached or affixed to the land or anything incidental or pertaining to the land, right? or anything that is attached that belongs to the new owner. Now, personal property becomes movable. It is all your furniture, clothing, jewelry, whatever, right? And in real estate, you can negotiate some personal property in the transaction, okay? So let's see. These are the definitions you need to know for sure. You need to know about fixtures. So what is a fixture? is something that is affixed, right, to a building by a person. So let's say you want to install, you know, fans in every bedroom, minimize uh, expense on the AC. So you buy three fans, you have three bedrooms in Home Depot. That's personal property. When you buy it, you take it home, that's personal property. But now this is gonna become a fixture because you're going to attach it to the property. So when this personal property is being installed or added to the wall, to the ceiling, right? What's going to happen? It's called annexation. You are adding the real, uh, the property, the personal property now becomes real property basically because it's part of the real property of the house. Now, Let's say you're moving after five years and you love those funds and you want to take it to the new house. When you remove it, that's when it's called severance. So you remove that from the real estate and as soon as you remove it, it becomes what? It becomes personal property again. Now, you have to be careful because if you list the property, you have to ask your listing agent, or sell, sell, seller and listing agent should be asking these questions. Are you taking the funds? Are you taking the uh, uh, shadows, the curtains, right? Are you taking the rods? Some people even take the rods. You're not supposed to take the rods so the next buyer comes and they can put their curtains on the lease, right? So anything that you think that the seller is not leaving you have to read your MLS. What is MLS? Multiple listing service. That's the description of the property. And in some of them, it will tell you whatever is excluded. Oh, seller is not included in the price, washer, dryer, uh, dishwasher, or uh, curtains, or whatever. And if it doesn't say nothing, it is your responsibility, if you are the buyer's agent, to make sure that you protect your buyer and you go and ask the listing agent, listen, I'm going to write the offer. I want to know what is included and what is not. And if he doesn't even know what is included, I will put it on the contract. Washer and dryer to, to remain with the purchase price. Curtains to remain. And if they counter me, when they counter me, then I'm going to know, oh, this is not covered. But if they never counter me and they accepted the deal and I put it in, then they have to leave it 
or they have to give me the wash and dry. Some cases, wash and dry are not included, right? They are not included, but we forget to put it in. And the buyer is thinking all the time throughout the transaction that the washer and dryer is gonna be included. So be careful, please, about this. Now, remember, fixture, something that you attach to the land. Annexation, when you add it, becomes real property. And when you remove it, it's severance, right? It's a fixture from real property. You're removing it, it becomes personal again. Now, how do you test in order to make sure this is a fixture or not? Well, we call it Maria, M-A-R-I-A. -A. And method of attachment, M stands for the method of attachment. How, how is it attached? The stronger is attached, the greater the probability is a fixture, right? Like if you buy those white fences in Home Depot that you put around the property, if you put it in, that will be attached, that will become person, uh, uh, real estate, right? Now, you're welcome to take it. If you disclose it that you're going to take it when you sell the property, you can take it and it will become again personal property. Now, the adaptability of the item, of the item right? So the greater the degree of adaptation for that particular land, the greater the likelihood that it's a fixture. Anything that is custom made, like mini blinds, furnace, pool cover, that is, uh, you know, that will become uh, a fixture. Now, the relationship to the parties. A tenant who attaches something to the property has a better chance of claiming it because it was personal property. So also it has to do, I, it stands for the intention. So if you, as a tenant, decide to install ring bell or the ring, and then you disclose to your landlord and you put it in writing, that when you move out, you're gonna take your ring and replace with the bell that he gave you from the beginning of the contract. You have to put it in writing, okay? And the last one would be an agreement of the parties. So anything that you think in the house that might be, don't assume that the items will be there or have to be like a wash and dry. Most agents assume that the wash and dry will remain there and it will not. It doesn't matter if you're paying $700,000. The wash and dry might be that the, the owners they just bought, especially the new ones, you know, the one that costs 3,000 each and they're almost your size. They, they even iron your clothes by itself. You just come put the, the clothes, washes it, and come and pick it up. It's ready. You don't even have to fall. You know, you have to ask. You have to put it in the contract. You know that every time I write an RPA, what is an RPA? Residential Purchase Agreement, right? Every time I write an RPA, I always request seller to leave two garage remote controls. I always put it on the uh, RPA. Because why? Most of the time, they forget to leave the remote controls. And if it's not in writing, the listing agent will not make any efforts to make sure that they will remain there. If he's going to have to pay it because you put it on the contract and th there was no counter saying, I'm not going to pay for it, then he must pay for it if the clients left, his client, his seller left, and they didn't put it back or left. And guess what door is usually closed last when you're moving out of a house? Can anybody guess? Can anybody let me know on the, on the left hand? What is the usually the last door that is usually closed after you move out. Wouldn't be the garage, right? Thank you, Annalie, the garage. And then when you leave, you back up your car, where do you have your remote control? In the car. Do you think when you have been moving all day your stuff, you're gonna remember, oh my God, I have to drop the garage, uh, remote garage control. Of course, you're not gonna um, um, re remember. So you're just gonna go and if you're going out of the state, bye-bye remote control. So guess what? 
If you put it on the RPA, you don't have to worry about it. your buyer will get two new remote control. He has to because it's in the contract. And if the seller already went and the listing didn't ask for it, it's not our problem. It is the listing agent problem. He has to replace it. So he will have to go and spend $40, $50 for two, I mean, each, right? But the buyer wants the remote control. It wasn't the contract. Okay. Perfect. And what else before we go? Okay, this one. Look at this beautiful kitchen. Now, when you're not certain of an item is real or personal, the buyer prefers the item to remain the sale of the home, right? So you have to ask on the written offer. So when in doubt, always write it up. Now, who can tell me, number one, can you write on the side? What is number one, guys? Real property or personal property? Real, very good, very good. Now, what about two? Real, yes. Um, okay, Monica, real. What about number six? Personal. Thank you, Annalie. What about number three? Kevin, personal. Excellent. And what about number four? Real, yes. Now, make sure, because there's some custom-made kitch uh, kitchens, right? You're aware of that. Some homes, they have custom-made kitchens. And the custom-made, most of the time, includes the refrigerator. But sometimes, the owner wants their own refrigerator. You know what I do when I go and see this kind of kitchens, you know? i very proactive. And I notice and I take even pictures, you know, even if the owner is not seeing me, I take pictures. Some of these homes, especially if they're 500, six, 700,000, they've been uh, upgraded, right? They have good brand uh, appliances. Like for example, Viking is one of them, right? So when you go and show the property to your client, I don't know if he's gonna be looking at the brand or not, but I am. And I'm going to make sure that if it says Viking, I know Viking costs a lot of money and the designs are really nice as well. So I'm going to make sure that those Viking brand or appliances remain in the property after close of escrow. I have to represent my buyer. And of course, I'm going to let them know. Because it already has happened to me. And that's what I'm sharing with you. I didn't know much. Suddenly, they replaced the appliances for a lower brand. You know, there is all different kind of brands. Not that one is better than the other one, but, you know. And if you're paying 500, 600, 700 million dollars, you expect the house to come with the same appliances that you, you check the house with, right? But there are some sellers out there that will try to be sneaky, you know, and, and, and switch these appliances like you don't notice. Some buyers would not notice, but not if they're working with me. I will make sure that the Vikings are there when I show the property and it will remain there. And I will put it on the contract. I'm very specific about it because I want to know from the beginning that those appliances will not be there or will be there. So in that way I can negotiate with the buyer. And if my buyer loves those appliances and he knows about the brand, then maybe if the seller wants to switch them, I'm sorry, then we cannot buy your home. We'll have to keep looking, right? Believe it or not, that could be an issue. You're saying, oh my God, how a buyer is gonna, you know, for, for biking appliances to this? Well, there is some buyers out there that really are very meticulous about, especially if you're paying a high price on a property and you know that you have, you know, the, the, those kind of appliances, okay? 
And lastly, let's see, land description, guys. When a real property changes hand, the documents describing the change in ownership must describe with precision the land involved in the transaction using the legal description. So legal description will be on the test, right? Now to avoid confusion, you know, confusion during describing a parcel of land, usually on a document, the grand deed or um, the note of trust, deed of trust, always there will be three different ways of having a land description. The first one is the assessor parcel number, the APN, assessor's parcel number. If you look at your property tax, they always have like a nine digit number, you know, that's your assessor parcel number. So the property can be identified by an APN. Then you have the street address, you know, your home street, that will be there. And also the legal description. So what is the legal description? When you read lot 15 and 16 of subdivision track number 1818 from subdivision, whatever, that is how the land description or the legal description works. That's another way of describing the property that you're buying, okay? So when dealing with real estate contract, these land descriptions are the most commonly used to describe the property location, just so you know. Now, land description also has the U.S. section township survey. And uh, uh, we said that we're not going to uh, have mostly questions about math questions. Then we will not. But these things, these um, three items you need to know, um, the meridian lines, the meridian lines, they run north to south, and the base lines, they run east to west. And these are two uh, has to do with the grid or imaginary lines. That's how they describe the land for the territories, the states and the public lands, right? And th these lines were drawn every six miles. Every six miles they draw a line, right? And now the, the numbers that they frequently use were one mile or 5,280 feet is equal to one mile. 46,543,000. 560 square feet, it would be one acre. And then 640 acres is equal to one square mile, okay? So you need to know these numbers. This is a township diagram, six miles. Remember every six miles, they draw a line. So this is six miles by six miles by six miles. So there is a total of 36 square miles or 36 sections. Every section is one square mile. So every number is one square mile, right? Now, one township, that's what it's called. One township is equal to 640 acres, right? That's what is equal to 640 acres. And one acre would be 43,560, right? Try to memorize these numbers. So when you see it on the test, you know, you don't waste time trying to figure it out, okay? Put it on your index card and review it every day if you can or when, when you're studying your definitions. And then the, the baselines, remember, they run from east-west and from meridian lines, they run from north to south, okay? And... Finally, this is lot and block survey. This is how, when you run a property profile, it tells you the characteristics of the property, right? Like three bedroom, two bath, square footage. But I also give you a map on how big is the lot size approximately and where is it located in that particular name, okay? These are usually used uh, on the grand deed, on the quick claim deed and the preliminary title report. Now, reminder for the new students, uh, complete all online quizzes. So after we you finish a chapter, you have to go online and then complete your quizzes. 10 questions, minimum is 60%. Be accountable and review all textbook material. Online quizzes will reflect the textbook material, but not all textbook material will be covered, okay, in the class. And you know that your quizzes and your final test would be open book, okay? And let's do the brain game. California became a state in what year, guys? 1850, right? The bundle of rights consists of apti. What is apti? Use, possess, 
transfer, encumber, and enjoy. When personal property is added to real property, what is it called? Annexation. You need to know these terms, guys. Which acronym do we use to determine if an item is a picture? Maria, right? Method, attachment, um, intention, attach. I forgot about it, but you can go back and review Maria. It is immovable. It can be land. It can be a fixture. What is that? Real property, right? And the last one, what does AAPN stand for? Assessor's parcel number. Okay, guys. Um, it's 12.15. I'll be back around uh, 12.35, 12.40, and then we'll go with chapter three, four, and five. For the newest students, if you were able, able to register, you know, or you're gonna do it next during the week, uh, go ahead and come back. So if you finish today, you already completed one Saturday. You only need two more, right? For the ones uh, that decide to join uh, the real estate course, okay? So guys, I'll be back and uh, I'll see you around 12.35, 12.40, okay? Thank you.